This is track number four of Elixir Comp 2020. This is Luke Imhoff and he's presenting Lumen, front and compiler. Luke, the broadcast now belongs to you. Hi, I'm Luke Imhoff. I'm known pretty much everywhere online as chronic death because I am filled with autoimmune diseases. I'm the creator of the IntelliJ Elixir plugin and architectural engineer at Dockyard. And most importantly for this talk, a member of the Lumen Core team. In this talk on Lumen, I hope to bring those new to Lumen up to speed so that then I can update those just hearing about Lumen and those that have been following the project from the beginning on our latest developments. To get everyone on the same page, let's introduce or reintroduce what Lumen is. Lumen is a new compiler and runtime for the Erlang, Elixir, and other Beam languages. It targets things that are difficult or impossible to target with the Beam, such as WebAssembly, x86 single executable binaries, and true embedded systems without an OS, such as microcontrollers. All places where we have to have one and only one file for deploys. Lumen compiled programs are a single executable binary. There's not a separate VM like the Beam that runs bytecode files. The compiled binary is native code for the respective targets. Lumen is produced by a core team and community volunteers. The Lumen core team is made up of Brian Cartarella, Paul Schoenfelder, myself, and Hans Josephson. Brian Cartarella started the team and sponsors the team through Dockyard. He's in charge of the marketing and community relations. He has the overall vision for the project. He found Dockyard and supports other open source efforts in Elixir, such as Phoenix. Paul concentrates on the compiler while also working on the parts of the runtime that interact with it, such as memory layout and garbage collection. Before joining the Lumen core team, Paul had a previous compiler, Aria, for strongly typed Erlang. I work primarily on the runtime and libraries like OTP and WebBIFs. I've learned Elixir internals from reimplementing the Elixir grammar for my IntelliJ Elixir plugin and Beam internals for my work on the graphical debugger for the same. Hans works on the compiler and has made an interpreter. Hans was already targeting WASM using his EIR project independently of us when he joined the Lumen core team. Beyond the core team, other members of the community have already been helping us. Lars Wickman wrote some of the early blog posts about Lumen and now maintains getlumen.org. Ricardo Echevarria did one of the earliest Lumen talks outside of the core team in October 2019, which was only a month after we announced it to the public. Brian, Josephson, uh, Brian Joseph, who is the creator of ElixirScript, was, has written some of the BIFs in OTP. Mike Wilkerson did IO list BIFs. Alan Matson, Zach Daniel, a former dockyarder. Uh, Nate Heidet and Quinn Wilton did the map BIFs. Christian Wesselhoff fixed some warnings in the code. Harlan Wood and George Metzoranis helped with the docs. Let's see how Lumen works. Your first interaction with Lumen will be through the compiler. Erlang is the lingua franca of the Beam ecosystem. So Lumen targets parsing Erlang and compiling it, but we need Erlang from other languages like Elixir. So first we compile the Elixir as normal, which gets us .beam files. With those Beam files, we no longer have to care about the source language as all languages on the Beam support decompiling to Erlang to support debugger interoperations. This is brought about by the debug I um, chunk that uh, Jose convinced the Erlang core team to support. And it's how uh, IEXPRI actually works. So when you do IEXPRI and you type Elixir code, it actually gets converted to Erlang code and then uses the Erlang compiler that you're actually shipping with in development to make the code that you're actually running when you pry. With Erlang source, either written by you or decompiled from your Beam language of choice, the Lumen compiler will compile the Erlang source to native code such as x 664 ARM, or WebAssembly. As an example, let's start with the simplest program that prints something. An Erlang program that uses the display that uses display one, which is meant for debugging, to print an atom called Atom. The first layer of Lumen is using Hans's EIR project to parse Erlang into a graph. EIR stands for Erlang Intermediate Representation, and intermediate representation is a format between the human readable code and the hardware-specific assembly. IRs are used in modern compilers as they allow for easier optimizations and for optimize, 
optimizations to be shared between languages. The EIR project is used by Lumen, but not specific to it. As I said, Hans was already working on it when he joined the team. You could use it to optimize Erlang code in general or the basis for compiling other languages to the beam. The EIR graph when printed looks like this. You'll notice that module full zero and module full one have been automatically added to the module because modules need to be able to talk about themselves even though we never write it explicitly. With the optimized graph from EIR, the Lumen compiler's code gen converts it to EIR MLIR. MLIR stands for multi-level intermediate representation. It is an IR above LLVM IR. It gives us access to hardware optimizations like GP, GPUs, and SIMD in a dialect called affine in, hardware, in a hardware agnostic manner because it uh, is built on the work that Google did to support TensorFlow across highly optimized CPUs, highly optimized GPUs, or custom um, boards for machine learning that like NVIDIA has brought out. The AR MLIR starts to care more about the types of variables and how exceptions are handled with what's called a personality function. Um, it being called a personality function is history from C, C++, it's what they call them there. It's how does your specific hardware deal with exceptions? And so like there's a different personality function on Linux than there is on Windows, because on Windows, they have a thing called structured exception handling where like the OS itself defines how exceptions work. Well, on Linux, it's just a convention that's brought about from GCC. Atoms no longer have names, but explicit values like 66. The EIR dialect of MLIR needs to be lowered to the LLVM MLIR dialect. LLVM stands for low level virtual machine. It's not a virtual machine like Java or the Beam where it runs code, but more a hardware agnostic target for compilers. It doesn't have to care if you're running x86, 64, or ARM, which is going to be a concern for us because of the Mac hardware switch again. Uh, but it's still low, low enough for details like atomics, registers with its memory, and pointers versus integers to show up. Because MLIR is multi-level, there's a version of LLVMIR in MLIR called LLVM MLIR. So when we're still in MLIR, we can mix EIR and affine and LLVM all in one spot and actually be able to switch between levels of dialect and it's okay. It is not okay to have multiple dialects in um, LLVM IR though. For the Lumen compiler, this is where we start to include parts of the runtime and that make Erlang Erlang, like reduction counts and yielding to the scheduler to allow processes to run concurrently. MLIR is built on top of LLVM, but the LLVM dialect of MLIR cannot be converted directly to assembly because it's not guaranteed to be the only dialect in your file. So first it is converted to just LLVM IR, which doesn't allow mixing dialects. In LLVM IR, the hardware abstractions start to fall away. The exact machine we're going to target is being recorded. If you, you look at the, the third line down, it says target trip when you see we're targeting a very specific version of x 664 Mac. And uh, yeah, from LLVM IR, the LLVM compiler libraries can lower to machine specific x86-64 assembly. The assembly is as close as we'll get to native here because after this point, it's all just numbers. You'll see here, even at its lowest level, Lumen built in yield and Erlang display one are still function calls on this file. That is because they are provided by the runtime and OTP library. The runtime and library supply code shared by all executables. They're what give Erlang its feel when running. The runtime supplies the schedulers that run and spawn processes. Timers for keeping track of timeouts, which are both explicit timeouts and implicit system timeouts like the ones you use on a receive after. Memory allocation and garbage collection and the linking and monitor process that give the Beam ecosystem its resiliency. The Lumen libraries supply the BIFs from OTP or new functions for interacting with the web that need to be written in Rust to interact with the Rust web crates. BIFs stand for built-in functions. They are functions written in C for Beam and Rust for Lumen. They are used when we need to care about and guarantee the exact type of a term and manipulate its in-memory representation. They are allowed to do mutable operations unlike Erlang code. The compiler and runtime allow us access to many interesting targets. A year ago, at ElixirConf 2019, Brian Cardarello revealed that Lumen is Elixir plus WebAssembly, but 
It's much more general than that. We can target anything where a single binary is advantageous. You can deploy a single file the same way Go or Rust can, which makes Lumen compiled Erlang or Elixir competitive in restricted deploy environments, like enterprises that are reticent to adopt new technology. This is because these environments usually give a language agnostic escape hatch for single binaries to support C or Bash scripts, but will allow us to sneak in Erlang and Elixir with Lumen. This can be a big deal for enterprises that adopt things like OpenStack where, or other places that use build pack like infrastructure um, because Elixir has never gotten official support in any of these build pack things because even for Heroku, hash nukes unofficial one is good enough that everyone uses it, but that means enterprises don't want to use it because it's not official so they can't get a support contract on it. And this, by using Lumen, we can deploy a single file and act like it's just a C binary and it'll just sneak through. Because we know everything for your program is contained in the final file, we can optimize across the whole program. You can link in all of OTP with its hundreds of BIFs that are completely unrelated and just in the Erlang uh, module for historical reasons. But your final binary will only include those functions that you actually call, the linker will throw away the rest as dead code. We can also, through constant folding, call closures like a normal function, which saves memory as we don't have to allocate the actual closer term anywhere. Now that everyone has the same background on Lumen, let's cover our progress over the last year. At ElixirConf 2019, I showed a spawn chain demo in the browser. This demo used the runtime and our reimplementation of OTP BIFs, but we didn't have the compiler to the point that we could compile directly from Erlang to WASM. So instead, I hand powered Elixir code to the Rust code with the equivalent calling convention that we thought the compiler would produce. We showed that Lumen's runtime can scale the 64,000 processes in a single browser tab while still remaining responsive through the use of uh, Rust WASM to do uh, request animation frames so that we can keep yielding to the, the UI thread and event loop in JavaScript without blocking it. It can create DOM elements and use event listeners to take input from forms. By Lone Star Elixir 2020, so in February of this year, we made enough progress on the compiler that it could compile simple sequential code, but it could only use compiler intrinsics. These are specific functions that the compiler knows exist, even though the runtime is supplying them. So it can't call arbitrary code from other shared libraries or static libraries. It could not call our OTP bibs, most importantly. The reason why the compiled code could not call the OTP bibs is because we actually have two runtimes. We there's the minimal runtime, which is minimal because it shows that the compiler works. And so it's the minimum required to get the compiler to actually compile code that like can do something interesting. While the full runtime can use the power of a fully operational OTP like a Death Star, but its calling convention does not work for compiled code. Since Lone Star Elixir 2020, the Lumen Core team is working to bridge this gap between the two runtimes. The first step was breaking OTP from Lumen Runtime, as Lumen Runtime was not general and so had a confusing name. It was only the full runtime. Since OTP was created as a library, it made sense to treat Lumen Web, which gives us access to the DOM and WASM, as a library too, and both give them the lib prefix. But thinking about it again, OTP and Lumen Web are both libraries for native implement functions, or what Erlang calls NIFs, and they were supported by Lumen Runtime macros. We group all those together into a native implement functions directory. So people that want to just work on BIFs and NIFs but not have to worry about the details of runtime can work on those alone. So it's easier for community contributions because you know that I should touch only these packages. Next, we didn't want to privilege the full runtime different from the minimal runtime. So full had to give up the Lumen runtime name because anyone working on the project that was super confusing that Lumen runtime wasn't the runtime and just became runtimes full next to the other runtimes in the runtimes directory. So anyone that wanna works on the runtimes but not the BIFs can work in this directory. The next problem was that runtimes full was completely independent of the other runtime crates. So we had runtimes core. So we made runtimes core truly core by putting common code into runtime core and then having both minimal and full use it. Uh, this was easier than it appears as Paul Schoenfelder had copied parts of the full runtime to make the minimal runtime when working on the compiler to make the compiler's code testable independently from my work on the runtime and the BIFs. Uh, 
And so mostly it was moving pieces up and down between the two crates to uh, figure out what can be common, what, what couldn't be, because it was architecture calling convention specific. Finally, we got to the point of either the full or minimal runtime being able to call OTP functions. I did this by having both runtimes just default to using the compiled codes convention. I, I mean, eventually the full runtime will kind of disappear and minimal will just become the runtime uh, once we can compile to all the targets we want to compile to. Uh, but the way we actually did this is that neither of them are actually dependent on the final runtime. They're actually dependent on core. And the reason for this is that each runtime implements the equivalent of like C's main. And so you can only link in the runtime once. You can't have each library that you need to link to uh, link into it. The keen observer may notice that while I opened the PR on April 6, we did not merge it until June 30th. Part of this is the sheer complexity of the change, but also as uh, Mike talked about in uh, Dockyard's uh, sponsor presentation, I was on client work during part of this time. Docker and architectural engineers, such as myself and Hans on the Lumen core team, spend 75% of our time on R&D, but the other 25% of our time is spent on client time so that we get industry usage sampling and we understand how the open source we're making is actually being used by everyone else in the community. We're looking for clients interested in using Lumen. Now, this would be a very early um, access to it. It would be very much like, we want to do this thing, but we're okay with a delay while you like target an embed system that we want. This is mostly so that when we add embed support, we know that someone wants to use it for a very specific chip because there are so many embedded architectures out there. Um, but if we're working with a client on Lumen, that means we're working on Lumen 100% of the time instead of being on client work doing something else. The team is also interested in any companies that want to become corporate sponsors alongside Docket of Lumen. This can uh, both uh, help us with infrastructure, like getting more Mac and uh, Windows development boxes, um, because right now it's very hard to do LLVM builds of Windows because they eat so much memory. But doing that on a Mac laptop with only 16 gigs of memory is, it, it, they keep crashing for all of us. It's, it's very hard actually. So we're, we're looking for people to help with that sort of infrastructure too. With the minimal runtime being able to use OTP, previous unit tests in Rust could be poured to Erlang and we could use the, the Lumen compiler to check that we could compile and run those integration tests. This has been an ongoing process from July 2nd through to the present. While I was generating those tests on top of OTP and modifying OTP in the runtime when necessary, Hans and Paul were working to fill holes in the EIR and the compiler revealed by those and other tests that they came up with for their respective layers. This includes adding support for more constants, efficient binary construction, receives, and try catch. Constants are important here because even on the beam, a literal, and for us a constant, is constructed in a different manner than if you construct a list from a head and tail that's like stored in memory. Constants are stored more efficiently, and they actually have to be lowered uh, differently so that they can remain constant when they're in the final binary, so it becomes memory efficient. We're not copying everything out of memory. It can stay in the read-only data. The integration tests also required enhancements from the runtime, as we could finally see places where we differed from Beam or places where our OTP only worked for the full runtime and not for the minimal runtime of compiler-generated code. This uh, was most glaring when I tried to test um, spawn monitor and it didn't work uh, because I totally forgot to change it. This includes changing the display output to match beam so that it's uh, more of an Erlang output than an Elixir output. We plan later on to add the ability to change the output to switch to like, so that you can plug in formatters to make it like Erlang, beam, or, or Gleam specific, or whatever, however your language formats uh, terms differently. A standard for runtime. So this included a standard for runtime spawning closures, uh, module function arities, and apply one and two. They became part of the runtime and their schedulers instead of uh, being something that the OTP library knew about. And harmonizing exception systems between the runtime and generated code. Um, we actually, for runtime exceptions, if anyone knows Rust, we actually use panics for that with a special tag so that either the Rust code uh, can panic or we get a runtime exception and we, we can catch that in the compiled code because the compiled code can see a Rust panic as like a 
as an exception with the personality function from C++. So we're actually able to use the exception system that is native to whatever target. So on Macs, we used you know, C++ style exceptions. On Windows, we would use structured exception handling. And on WASM, we'll be able to use the WASM support for exceptions, which means, uh, which is very important WASM because otherwise we can't actually walk up the stack. You're not allowed to see your stack in that way on WASM for security reasons. With the completion of catch and try catch this last week, we believe that EIR being able to parse and the Lumen compiler being able to lower all Erlang constructs to be feature complete. This is a huge accomplishment for the project. Now let's go to some of the benefits of Lumen. As an example of the optimizations that the compiler can do, while testing apply to, I need to ensure that anonymous functions without on the left and with environment on the right could work. Both tests displayed the correct results, but I had extra debugging at the time and I could see that I wasn't actually creating an environment, which means my test wasn't actually testing that closures with environments were being passed around correctly. Looking at the EIR or Erlang intermediate representation as we saw earlier, um, we see the environment length is zero for both cases. So I'm definitely not testing environment handling correctly. Thatum, because it is only used from inside the anonymous function has been sucked out of start and put into just the body of the anonymous function. So there's no environment to pass. These optimizations occur because of Hans's EIR before we even get to MLIR or LLVM. The EIR graph simplification pass has four stages. First, it analyzes the graph looking for continuous chains of control flow. Second, inside each chain, dead and unused variable nodes are dropped. With those nodes dropped, a new minimal control flow is created, which is then used to update the IR. So these passes were able to see that we didn't use the environment variable actually in start, but we did use it in the closure. So it could see that it could make it, mark it as dead code on the chain for the start function, but live in the anonymous function and then just pull it in. And that means we didn't have to construct a closure to hold that environment variable on a packet, which saves us multiple instructions for the packing and unpacking of that closure. Um, EIR is very important even with using MLIR on top of uh, LVM IR because EIR is built on top of a newer um, technology for optimization called Thorin, where it's stuck as a graph instead of single static assignment. And Thorin is able to handle inlining and outlining anonymous function calls and higher level uh, functions much better than any of the other tech we're built on. And so it, it is super important for efficient use of turning anonymous functions into direct function calls or anonymous functions into for loops and, and things like that that will run much faster on native hardware. From those four stages, we get all these optimizations, which leads to a lot of dead code, such as the environment from applied to example being eliminated and replaced with a propagate constant. Let's see what the future has in store for Lumen. While we have implemented the OTP BIFs using Rust, we want to, when possible, use the same Erlang source as Erlang OTP for everything else. In addition to porting our BIF tests in Rust to Erlang, we have also forked Erlang OTP to, to test compiling with Lumen. We expect to have to change parts of init as it is too tied to loading beam files. Like it knows that there's a boot script. It knows that there's app files like, and that there are only files. It is not set up to not have a file system. And we'd rather not trick it into thinking there's a file system embedded it as resources in the binary. And instead we'll just make changes to those and um, keep upstreaming, uh, keep, uh, vendoring changes and doing updates against the real OTP while we use as much as the Erlang that isn't tied to the file system layout of .beam files, et cetera, um, the same. Once that's possible and we can use their net without the file dependency, we'll be able to boot multiple applications. So if anyone's open observer, you'll see like when you boot up Elixir, you have like 10 or 12 applications already running, we'll be similar to that. With applications bootable, we can then use Erlang OTP's own tests since the test frameworks are applications to check that we conform to its behavior. So treat it as a de facto Erlang spec, even though there is no formal specification for Erlang yet. With the compiler working and testable for XA664, we want to move to getting WASM compiling too, but we continue to encourage various design proposals for features that will make Erlang Elixir in the browser more competitive. Being able to use stack walking or inspection for GC inside the WASM stack 
will be more space efficient than our current approach as we need to ship less GC infrastructure. Stack blocking will allow us to keep most of the memory on the WASM stack, which means we potentially will never have to use the process heap, which means we don't have to do as many malloc calls and it'll just be um, a much better experience overall and use up less memory. Stack switching is far more crucial though to efficiently swapping between processes. It is how we swap processes on XA664. We can do this on XA664 because it's kind of a free for all, but in WASM, currently stack switching isn't allowed because we can't actually see the stack as a security mechanism. Without either type continuation or first class stacks, we'll need a much different way of compiling the code on WASM than XA664 that would require us to main stack frames on the heap instead of using WASM's own stack. This would be similar to the approach that I used in the spawn chain demo, but it is much slower and much more uh, uses much more memory than uh, what, uh, than WASM native stack switching would. The future, that's the future. But what if you want to use Lumen now? Well, as of 10 hours ago, we put out a release. Uh, you can go download it for Mac OS and Linux, and, and you don't have to build it for yourself anymore, which is great. We'll set up a demo project with a bin and build directory. As I mentioned in future work, we don't currently use OTP's init process, and instead you define init start zero directly as entry point to your application. We can then use Lumen to compile the Erlang into a native XA664 binary. We can then run binary of Alex, Alice greet Bob. If we don't pass the right number of arguments, we can use argument zero like you would in a bash script or, or C. Arg, argv zero is always the name of the program. It's just a convention in operating systems to show how to invoke it again. If you want to see all the build intermediates, like I, I showed in the introduction, you can use emit all and they'll be put in your build directory, the, the thing you mark with output dir. You can join the community contributors and help us. Lo anyone can run the Loom compile against a file from Erlang OTP or any important dependencies in the ecosystem to find edge cases we haven't hit yet. Like the parse control, parse transforms can produce weird syntax. Um, there could be weird syntax with type specs. Like we need to parse everything that's in real source, even if it doesn't affect the native execution is the way to phrase it. Cause that way we can produce better errors. Help convert Rust unit tests to Erlang integration tests for Liblumen OTP as I've been doing. You can also help with guides, blog posts, documentations, uh, doing uh, your own uh, talks about Lumen to your meetups or other conferences, all that stuff. If you have questions, you can ask them now, and I'll look in a bit at my phone to see the questions everyone has. Or you can reach us on Twitter at, at GitLumen, uh, on GitHub, uh, on the website getlumen.org, uh, on the Elixir Slack channel Lumen. There's a link there. We have uh, weekly uh, core team meetings that are open to everyone on Jitsi. Just go to the Slack channel and you'll see it. Um, and you can participate too. Um, and yeah, you can go to GitHub to get the installation instructions that I showed a screenshot of. All right, thank you, Luke. It looks like we have a couple of questions. Okay, let me just bring up the questions. Which library in the source code does the optimizations? Um, it depends on the layer. So parts of EIR do the graph simplification, like I mentioned. So some of that um, EIR is not under the Lumen name because it Hans had it ahead of time. So if you go to EIR project, EIR and GitHub, a lot of it goes there. So if you look in, if you look the top level Lumen crate is like the compiler we interact with. But if you look at that, it calls the compiler driver. So there's an entire compiler subdirectory. And in there you can look at code gen and it is going to call in and do the lowering. If you see a bunch of stuff like MLI to Elva, VR and um, Salsa mentioned. Salsa is a, um, a tool in the Rust ecosystem for making compilers. So everything that is mentioned in Salsa is about the compiler. Um, so that does that optimization. The LLVM and MLI optimizations are, there's a bunch of C++ code and a thing called uh, table definitions for generating C++ code that has to do with how we define the operations to MLIR. And so some of that is, there's a bunch of stuff called conversion ops if you look in the source for that. And that's 
converting them down and doing some optimizations. Some of the optimizations are just like, we get them for free with MLR and LLVM. Um, under the Lumen organization, there is an LLVM project where we have it forked, but we don't, we don't really make changes to LLVM. It's mostly, it is much easier when we add Lumen as a new dialect directly to LLVM than to do it after the fact with a script. So like, that's the only reason why we have LLVM forked. And it's mostly so that we don't get breaking upstream changes because LLVM upstream changes super rapidly. So Paul um, inspects like each change to, to see how it will affect us and whether we can use it to make our code better or if it'll break stuff. Um, so that's mostly why we have the fork. Um, if someone wanted to contribute BIPs, could you use Rustler? No, no. so this is a, a misunderstanding. Uh, so there are BIFs and there are NIFs. BIFs are written in C and like shipped. And so like uh, I call the macro native implemented functions because we can use them for both, but it does not support the NIF interface with like the C header files that um, is produced, like, like that is used with Erlang Beam. We don't support that. One, because in Rust we can do better. Like the C interface, uh, you have to manually like register a constructor and a destructor and a printer. And that's like, and it's very error prone and, and potentially buggy and seg faulty. And so like, we don't have that in Rust. We can make it in a much safer way. So like we don't use Rustler because Rustler is a way to make the C interface for NIFs uh, on Beam nicer and safer, but our interface that Lumen uses is already safe because it's in Rust. So no, not right now. We we might, if like a NIF is hard enough to port, we might end up putting in like a, a a shim or something so that you can use NIFs that are that you can't change. But right now it's it's better to write Rust wrapper code directly uh, that targets Lumen. Okay. Uh, those were the only uh, two questions we had in the question submitter for now. So thanks everyone. Thanks again, Lou. That was Lumen uh, Runtime and Compiler, and it was a great talk.